Good morning, viewers. This is the Colonel speaking to you live from the Grange for British Imperial YouTube Broadcasting. And today we've got something unusual. Yes, I know I said that before, but this is true. I don't think I've seen another copy of this record, and I doubt whether anyone else has. Ten-inch record, The Meaning and Value of Free Thought, Parts 1 and 2, by Mr Chapman Cohen, President of the National Secular Society, 1932. Manufactured by Edison Bell Limited shortly before they went bust. Anyway, it wasn't due to this, viewers, I don't think. Here we go. I will commence with a definition. Free thought may be defined as the rejection of authority in matters of opinion. It sets the persuasion of fact against the coercion of force. A free thinker is one who forms his own opinions on the facts as he sees them. Right or wrong, his opinions are his own. He is a voice, not an echo. Historically, free thought has become identified with the rejection of religious doctrines. This is because it is from the side of religion that the impulse to intolerance has come. Human society is born in the shadow of religious fear. And in that stage, the suppression of heresy is a sacred social duty. Then comes the rise of a priesthood, and the independent thinker is met with punishment in this world and the threat of eternal damnation hereafter. Even today it is from the religious side that the greatest danger to freedom of thought comes. Religion is the last thing that man will civilize. Considerable progress was made in the old Greek and Roman civilizations in the way of establishing freedom of thought. Neither had anything in the shape of a sacred book warning men not to eat of the tree of knowledge. And in Greece particularly, every question of religion, ethics, science and philosophy were discussed with a freedom that Europe subsequently lost and has never altogether regained. Indeed, if it were possible to revive an Athenian of, say, the time of Socrates and place him in the centre of Europe at any date from the 5th to the 16th century, and if he had seen the prison, the stake and the torture chamber being used to prevent criticisms of religion, he would have thought that the world had been overtaken with an epidemic of insanity. The intellectual freedom of Europe died with the establishment of the Christian Church. Bible in hand, the Church met every new idea with a thus saith the Lord. On the ruins of the ancient civilization, she placed the flag of an interested dogmatism and opened one of the most hideous chapters in the history of mankind. Inquiry was forbidden, freedom of speech was taboo, a premium was offered to cowardice and hypocrisy. A tax was placed upon intellectual sincerity. Intolerance became a virtue and persecution a habit. Nothing more demoralizing has ever existed. Where religious heresy was concerned, no man could feel himself safe. In the name of religion, a man was taught to denounce his neighbor, a wife her husband, a child its parent. The church went further and made a man a policeman over himself until men feared to think lest they should be led to doubt. The thinker was everywhere suspect. The credulous fool was held up as the model of religious perfection. It was the vilest system the world has ever known. Right, see we go for side two viewers. In prohibiting the free play of ideas, the church struck at the foundation of progress. Throughout the whole of animate nature, variation is one of the conditions of development. The opposite process is elimination, by which unfavorable or undesirable variations are weeded out. The church adopted the latter policy. Every variation against its teaching was crushed. It imposed conformity on all with the result of achieving stagnation and worse. A sheep-like attitude was inculcated, and where men are trained like sheep, they share the fate of sheep. They are sheared and eaten. 
Had a bench of bishops existed amongst our Simeon ancestors, the human race would never have arisen. The first variations towards a more human type would have been crushed as a blasphemous innovation. In the history of every institution there is a time when it has to face the challenge of new knowledge. The man who does this is an asset of great social value. He compels us to something like a mental stock taking to get rid of unusable goods and to restock on better lands. The greatest need of today is to create an environment that is completely hospitable to new ideas. The vote spreads political power over a wide area but carries no guarantee of its right use. All can read, but reading without the critical habit is of but small value. The press flashes its lightning, and the mass of the public are without a conductor that will protect it from its dangers. There never was a time when there was greater need for independent thinking than there is today. Unfortunately, 15 centuries of Christian rule has made intolerance of unorthodox opinions fatally common. In the Christian mythology, it is noted that man's primal sin was an act of disobedience. He ate of the tree of knowledge, and the gods cannot forgive that offense. Yet knowledge is the greatest need of mankind. It is that which has raised him from savage to civilization. It is that which makes him more than the equal of the gods. It lifts him above them. But you cannot acquire sound knowledge without the courage to examine, modify, reject what is already established. This is a painful and troublesome process, but the pain is that of a new birth, the trouble that of clearing away things that have outlived their utility. Free thought, then, claims the fullest possible freedom of thought, speech, publication and action. It asks for these not as luxuries, but as necessities, not for their mere toleration, but for their encouragement. They must be the unquestioned and inalienable rights in a society where men and women can exist with dignity and self-respect. Well, there you go, viewers. Uh, I should point out to you that we here at The Grange, being from a rather old-fashioned uh, religious uh, point of view, nearly 500 years old now, but uh, there are few enough of us to keep it going. But we don't agree with that man, but there's no reason why I shouldn't show it to you, and you can make up your minds. There we are. Thank you viewers, and goodbye.